Good morning, Church. I'm going to ask you a question. I'd like you to answer it, but only in your own mind and on your own heart. I don't want you to t tell the person next to you. Question is, how much do you love God? On a scale of 0 to 20, how much do you love God? 0 is you don't love God. 20 is you can't, you're just bursting with love and you can't help yourself. Just, just put a figure in your own mind how much you think you love God. That's just your perspective. Uh, obviously you may ask God and God may give you a different figure, but that's just your perspective for now. And uh, I want you just to reflect on that uh, as we speak and as we go through the week. Another question is, this one you can answer, you, I would like you to give me some, some feedback. If you were to give advice to a brand, na brand new baby Christian and they ask you, how do I love God? Or how do I love God more? What advice you would, would you give that, that new Christian? Don't be shy. Don't worry if your answer is the right or the wrong one. Just want to hear some thoughts. How would you advise somebody? How can that new person love God more? Reading the Bible, reading God's Word. <clears throat> yes? Talk to God and listen to what God is telling you. Yeah, so praying. Murray? Yes. Listen when you're in, in Sabbath school, when you're in, in, in during a sermon or whatever, when there's that kind of thing. To strive um, to be more like Christ. To strive to be more like Christ. Strive to be more like Christ, yes. Keep reading about the crucifixion. Keep reading about the crucifixion of Jesus. Amen. So those are, are some very good ideas. And uh, I know you have many, many more, but we, we don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, the title of our sermon is How to Love God, and between brackets, more. Because hopefully we all love God already, but how do we love God more? Let's pray. Dear God, you are our Father, and you have promised that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And we stand on that promise here this morning. Draw near to us, Heavenly Father, and reveal yourself to us as a God of love. And show us how we can love you just a little bit more every day. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to come with me to Egypt, where we, we will start our, our message today. Egypt, where the Israelites find themselves slaves to the Egyptians and suffering under the whip of the slave masters. We know the story, I'm not going to go all the details, but we know the story of the Exodus, uh, where God sent Moses to come and deliver the Israelites from, from their slavery. And uh, they find themselves on a journey um, into the wilderness, and um, eventually they find their way to, to Canaan. And we know that the journey through the wilderness was characterized by the, the Israelites' um, disbelief, disobedience, moaning and groaning. How long after they left Egypt do you think did they start groaning and moaning? At the crossing. Yeah? Okay. At the crossing. It took them how many days? Three days into the journey when they started their moaning and groaning and they never stopped. Um, and we know that most of them actually didn't uh, make it to Canaan uh, because of that. So that's the, the journey, Egypt, the wilderness, and, and, and Canaan. And if you look at the map, uh, the way the maps are, are drawn, uh, then Egypt is to your top left, wilderness is down there, and Canaan is top right. So I actually made a, a little diagram that summarizes my sermon. So you'll see what I mean. So I said Egypt, Egypt is top left, your top left. 
wilderness, and then they went to Canaan. And if you look at the map, the distance between Egypt and Canaan is actually very short, but the journey took them all the way into the wilderness and back up. And that uh, dotted line there represents the journey God wanted them to take, but because of their disobedience and their moaning and groaning, they ended up going through the wilderness experience before they got to, to, to Canaan. So that's sort of the background to, 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 to part of our message today. And interestingly, in Egypt, through the wilderness <clears throat> and in Canaan, they were, the Israelites were surrounded by, by evildoers. You'll see what I mean when, I, when we continue next. So there were these pagan tribes and people all around them, isn't it? Um, and um, so we want to go to Psalm 37, our scripture reading, where we're going to spend most of our time today. And verse 1 says, I'm reading from the Amplified Version, 37 verse 1, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. And um, first one has to look at fret not, then we look at evildoers. Fret not, the concept of fret not, st don't stress, don't worry, don't, you know, be, don't, don't worry yourself. There are two, two connotations to fret not. The one, one is a picture of constant rubbing and irritation. And what comes to my mind is a little stone in your shoe when you're walking along and how that little stone irritates you and rubs you and if you don't do something about it you have a big blister at the end so it's not long before you have to take your shoe off isn't it so that's one one uh, um, meaning of, of fret not of, of fretting and the other meaning is to devour so when when we fret that fretting is like we are being devoured we're being eaten up and the picture that comes to my mind is of a snake devouring a little mouse and that is what happens when we stress and worry and fret about things is that um, we allow that thing to to devour us and this um, fret not um, actually reminded me about this story one summer night during a severe thunderstorm a mother was tucking her small son into bed she was about to turn the light off when he asked her in a trembling voice mommy will you stay with me tonight Smiling, the mother gave him a warm, reassuring hug and said tenderly, I can't, dear. I have to sleep in Daddy's room tonight. A long silence followed. At last, it was broken by a shaky voice saying, The big sissy. <laughs> so, Psalm 37 verse 1, we said, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. So the question then is, what is an evildoer? You're allowed to say something now. What, what, what do you think? What, what does the Bible say? What is an evildoer? Person who goes against God. Somebody who goes against God, yes. What else does the Bible say? What is an evildoer? Other words that we read in the Bible. Dangerous. Wicked. Murderers. Murderers. Naughty. Naughty. Somebody out of fellowship with God? Yep. So there's lots of words the Bible uses, isn't it? When I thought about this, I thought how easy it is for us to say, oh, I'm not an evildoer. Immediately we think, oh, you know, those people out there, um, they evildoers. And, or, and uh, I came across Psalm verse 52, Psalm 52, sorry, verse 7, but uh, 6 helps to illustrate it. So I'll read 6. But 7 is the one that, that we want to concentrate. Uh, verse 6 of Psalm 52. The uncompromisingly righteous also shall see it and be reverent, and be in reverent fear and awe. But about you, they will say scoffingly, laugh, and saying, verse 7, See, this is the man who made not God his strength, his stronghold and high tower, but trusted in and confidently relied on the abundance of his riches, seeking refuge and security for himself through his wickedness. The New King James version, version puts it a bit differently. So verse 7 firstly said, the wicked did not make God his strength. 
And when we don't make God our strength, automatically, where do we put our strength? In ourselves, <laughs> isn't it? In ourselves, sometimes in other people. So that's one aspect of being wicked, is when we don't put our strength in God, but we put it somewhere else. Second thing is, when we wicked, if we trust in the abundance of our riches. So if we put our trust in material things, rather than in the treasures that we have in God, um, then that is another sign that we are wicked. The third, third one uh, is really for me the one that opened my eyes. It said, the wicked strengthens himself in his wickedness. And I thought about that. Well, how, how do we strengthen ourselves in our wickedness or in our righteousness then, if, if, if we are not wicked? And um, I thought there are three T's, basically. The one is our thoughts. The second one is how we talk. And the third one is our actions. So I wanted all three to have T's. So I said the third T is how we thrust. And thrusting means how you push forward, isn't it? How you behave yourself. So when we think thoughts that lean towards wickedness, we will have feelings that go with that, isn't it? Uh, we will talk along the same lines. We will say things to ourselves and to other people that are along the same lines. And thirdly, we will thrust, we will act accordingly. And that is how you strengthen yourself in your wickedness, is your thoughts, how you talk, and how you behave. And uh, I will leave you some, I'll leave you to think about that some more uh, when you reflect, hopefully, on the sermon uh, later on. How, how can we do the opposite then? That's strengthening ourselves in our wickedness. But God wants us to strengthen ourselves in our righteousness, which is his righteousness, not, not our own. Um, and we do it with the same, the, the, the three T's. Coming back to our, our story of the Israelites in Egypt, the wilderness experience, and Canaan, um, I call them the three, three countries where the, the Israelites live. Although the wilderness, strictly speaking, was not a country, um, but I call them the three countries. So they, the, the, the Israelites lived in Egypt, in the wilderness, and in Canaan. And uh, I wanted to suggest that um, these represent the three countries of our daily lives as well, our daily experience as human beings. We live either in Egypt, in wilderness, or in Canaan. And I actually call them the three realities of life. The first reality the, the Egypt experience, I call that predicament. Um, the second one is um, uh, the, the promise, uh, sorry, problems. The second reality of our lives is prom problems, and the third reality is the, pr the promise. And what I mean by that is, in, our, in the predicament, our lives, we're either in a crisis, we have some big, big problem that we have to deal with and, 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 and handle, that's predicament, or Maybe it's not a crisis, but we live in the land of problems where we have challenges that we face, uh, difficulties, struggles. Maybe they relate to relationships. Maybe it's health challenges. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's our finances. But we're struggling with these things, isn't it? So we live in the, the wilderness. Um, and then the third reality is the, 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 the promise where we... We, we have good results, positive outcomes, uh, and, good, and good consequences. So I want to contend that each one of us here today, we're either, either living in one of those three uh, realities. We're either having a predicament, we're having a problem or problems, or we're living in the promised land. And I want to suggest to you that spiritually, we have the same realities in our lives. We either live in the country of predicament, sin is what I call the predicament, uh, or we live in problem, problems where we're dealing with challenges, um, and those challenges may be challenges of, 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 of doubt, maybe challenges of lack of faith, maybe uh, uncertainty, maybe fear, maybe turmoil in a spiritual context. Um, or the third spiritual reality that we may live in is the promise, uh, the, the, the reality of promise, where we feel that our salvation is, is assured in Jesus Christ, where we, we feel that we are 
living in God's kingdom, and we can live in God's kingdom here on earth, isn't it? That's what the Bible teaches. Um, the, Bible, the kingdom of God doesn't start in heaven, but it starts here uh, on earth. And um, what helps us, or, or the only way that we can live in the promised land here on earth, is if we have Jesus in our lives, isn't it? Because God sent Jesus as our deliverer, just as God sent Moses as the deliverer for the Israelites to deliver them from the slavery. Um, so God sent Jesus to, live, to deliver us from our sins. We don't have to live in the land of predicament. We don't have to live in the, in the land of, of problems. God wants us to live in the land of, of promise, even here on earth, um, while we 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 alive on earth, and <clears throat> so we can live in the promised land. And by the way, you you would have noticed that when we read the story of of Canaan, that um, there were giants in in Canaan, isn't it? There were bigger problems in Canaan than they had in the wilderness or even in G in Egypt. But the difference is that God was the one who was fighting their battles. So when I'm saying that we live in the land of promise, or we can live in the land of promise here on earth, I'm not suggesting that we're not having problems, that we don't have giants that we have to face, and issues and challenges that we have to deal with. But the difference is, when we live in the promised land here on earth, is that we're fighting with God's strength. God is the one who is dealing with these uh, challenges that we face. And we don't have to do it in our own strength. So the question is, how can I then live in the promised land here on earth? So, so Psalm 37, as I said, we're going to spend most of our time there. The first verse tells us what we're not to do. And we said, fret not. Um, so the Bible says, God is telling us, don't worry, don't stress yourself. But Psalm 37 also tells us what we must do. And uh, we're going to look at three commands that God gives us in Psalm 37. Um, and I would like you to remember that God's commands are actually promises. Uh, God's commands are invitations to us to be blessed. Now, in case you don't believe me, I'd like us to go to um, Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're just going to read the first two verses. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 and 2. So this is uh, the message from God. If you will listen diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, being watchful to do all his commandments which I command you this day, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you heed the voice of the Lord your God. And then it goes on. Uh, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed, blessed shall you be in the, in the field. And it goes through all the blessings that uh, the people will have if they obey God. And uh, further on, it also gives the curses. So if, if we don't obey God, then, um, then there are consequences to that as well. So all God's commands are associated with blessings, with promises, and... They are invitations to be blessed. So if you want to be blessed, do what God asks you to do, basically. So we're going to look at verse 3, Psalm 37, verse 3, um, where it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So that's the command that God is, 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 is giving to us. And um, our children's story was about trusting God, wasn't it? Um, and I was thinking about... Um, Auntie Eunice's dangerous chair that I don't trust really so, so well. I'm always a bit careful when I sit on that. Um, but the two chairs behind here, behind the pulpit, seem to be safe because uh, Eunice seems to be quite relaxed on there. She obviously trusts that chair. She's leaning all her weight on it and she looks quite uh, happy and comfortable on it. She doesn't look worried. So she obviously trusts that chair. Um, and so do you. You're all sitting very comfortably on your chairs. And that's what God wants us to do. To trust in God means to lean on him with your full weight and to let him uh, carry the weight that you are carrying, isn't it? And so that's what God wants us to do. He commands us to say, trust in me um, and 
verse, verse 3 says, trust and do good. So it's not just about trusting God, but it's how we, uh, what we can do for others. Uh, that is part of that command. And then the promise is, the rest of the verse says, So he shall dwell in the land and feed surely on his faithfulness, and truly you shall be fed. So when we trust God, then we can live our lives, uh, and God will be the one who will feed us. He will make sure that our needs are met, um, and we don't have to worry about that. So that's the first promise and the, the, first, uh, uh, the, the first command and the first promise. Verse 4 is the next one. next command is, Delight yourself also in the Lord. So that's the, the command. And um, if you imagine you've never seen a watermelon before in your life, and I brought one in and I gave you a nice big watermelon, never seen it before in your life, and I say to yourself, delight yourself in this watermelon, how are you going to go about that? Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> So um, you might want to first find out what is this thing, isn't it? You've never seen a watermelon before. You might not want to just tuck in, but yes, you'll, in this day and age, you might go on, on the internet and Google it and see. Uh, or you might ask. Or you might ask, and then you will have enough information to say, well, actually, let me open it and eat this thing that they say is so lovely. If you gave it to me, Yes, I know. Uh, if my wife were here, she would fight you for it. <laughs> um, so, yes, you will open it and you will tuck in and you will really become a, a, a convert, isn't it? Hmm, watermelon. And that's what God wants us to do with him. He wants us to get to know him, but not just head knowledge. He wants us to really get stuck in there and get to know him and taste um, and see that he's good as he promised us in his word. And um, um, I, I'm, it reminds me that when we praise God, we are delighting ourselves in God, and we are delighting God as well, because when we praise God, it makes him happy, isn't it? And uh, I've sort of put a little reminder for myself, because God is our father, so uh, uh, Papa reminds me that God is my father, but the first PA is to praise God for his attributes. In other words, I praise God for who he is, for his character. Um, and the second part of Papa is um, to remind me that I need to praise God for his actions. And in other words, for what he's done. And God has done wonderful things for people in the Bible. God has done wonderful things for people that we know, what we've heard about. But most of all, God has done wonderful things for us in our own lives, isn't it? And so we've got lots that we can praise God for. Um, so if you get a little bit stuck, um, just remember Papa and praise God for his attributes. Praise him for, for his actions. Um, and recently what I've, um, what I've done, I've had some um, words describing God with a, a, a scripture next to it. And then um, I would just... Um, just take them out and just take one of those and think about it. So, God my Father, and there's a scripture, and I'll read that, and it just gives me something to, to think about, to praise God about, um, and to be thankful for. So the command is, delight yourself in God. And it's interesting, to s if you look at the, 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 the verse 1, it said, fret not yourself. So it's not somebody else who's stressing you and making you worry. It's you the one who's doing that. Um, and in this verse, it says, um, delight yourself. So again, it's not somebody else who's going to come in and say, hey, you know, you better praise God. You must uh, 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 taste and see that he's good. We have to do it for ourselves. And uh, the promise is God will give you the desires and petitions of your heart. So our desires and our petitions are going to uh, be the same as what God would want for us. So that was the second command and promise. The third one we see in verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will bring it to pass. So the, the, the command is commit. Commit your way. Another version says, commit yourself. So again, 
it's, uh, it's telling us that somebody else is not going to mit commit you. You're going to have to commit yourself to God. And um, the word commit <coughs> has the meanings of rolling your weight on God. Again, similar to, to trusting God. To repose means to relax and, and enjoy. Um, it also means to give yourself over completely. Or another word one could use is to surrender. Um, and when I, I thought of the word commit, uh, the picture came to my mind of uh, if you were to eat um, uh, uh, lamb, sausage and egg. I know you don't eat meat, so this morning I'm sure you didn't have lamb, sausage and, and egg for breakfast. But let's say you did, just for, for illustration purposes. Um, there are two animals that we can mention here in this breakfast, isn't it? One is a chicken, one is a lamb. And uh, the chicken was involved because it donated an egg, but it's still walking around somewhere out there. Uh, so it was just involved. But the lamb was committed, wasn't it? It had to give all so that you could have your lovely lamb sausage for breakfast this morning. So that's the difference between being involved and being committed. So that's what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to, not to donate a little something to him and then we go and do our own thing and, 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 and sin as much as we like. He doesn't want us to be involved. He wants us to be committed to him. He wants us to give us everything that we've got. And there are lots of verses in the Bible that we can, we can think, think about. I just want to look at one, um, which is um, Romans 12, verse 1. So I'll quickly go there. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You know it, but... Uh, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Just want to take from that, it, it says, um, present yourself as a living sacrifice to God. So, living sacrifice seems a contradiction, isn't it? Because if you're a sacrifice, you, you know, the lamb sacrificed is dead. But when we sacrifice ourselves to God, when we give our all to Him, then God gives us back a new life. And so in that sense, we are living sacrifices. And we, can, we have to every day commit ourselves to God. We have to every day um, be that living sacrifice. Uh, and then God will uh, live in us and through us. So that's the command, and the, the, the promise is he will bring it to pass. He will make you succeed. He will help the plans that you have to, to come to fruition. In fact, the plans that you have will be according to God's plans for your life. So that's the promise. He will make you succeed. And then verse 7 of Psalm 37. Um, <clears throat> it reads, Be still and rest in the Lord. Wait for him and patiently lean yourself upon him. Fret not yourself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. I just want to look at the first part of that verse, where it says, Be still and rest in the Lord. Wait for him and patiently lean yourself upon him. Now, if you go to the diagram again, you will notice that um, the T on your left is what we were talking about, trust. The D is the delight yourself in God. The C is commitment. And they all actually, I should have drawn arrows from there. They all point inwards. Because ultimately that's what God wants for us. When he asks, commands us to trust him, it's because he wants us to have, the P is peace. God wants us to have peace. And you notice there's a heart around it. And that's, we will love him more. Because the more we, we trust God, the more we love Him, and the more peace we have, and the more we will trust Him. So they go like that, isn't it? Um, the more we delight ourselves in God, the more we will be at peace in ourselves, and the more we will love God. The more we commit ourselves um, to, to God, the more we will be at peace, the more love for God we will have. Um, so that verse 7 is really the center of the whole psalm. Because that's where God really wants us to be. 
It's not because he, he, he wants to be uh, uh, you know, just his ego, because he wants us to taste and see that he is good. So you would have noticed that the title of my sermon is How to Love God More. And uh, you might have wondered along the way where the love was coming from, but now you know, it's right there in the middle. Uh, Deuteronomy 6 verse, five, verse, verse 5, after all, uh, the greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So this is how we love God, when we trust and do good, when we delight ourselves in God, when we commit ourselves fully to God, then we will have the peace and the love for God. So the question is then, coming back to what I asked you at the beginning is, how much do you love God? I'm not going to ask you to give me your answer, even now. You can keep it secret, just between you and God. But now you have a way of looking at that and say, well, I say I love God, and it's, a, let's say, a, a 10. Um, so you have a way of measuring yourself. How much do I really trust God and do good for, uh, to others? How much do I really delight myself in God? And how much do I commit myself? And you can apply the T-test. Remember, we're talking about... Um, the three T's. So if you say you trust God, have a look at your thoughts. How much are your thoughts along the way of saying, I trust God with whatever this is that I'm facing, whether it's something small, whether it's something big. How much are my thoughts along that way that, yes, God, I trust you to deal with this thing for me. Um, so yeah, maybe your thoughts are there, but am I talking uh, in a way that shows that I trust God? And remember, we talk to ourselves, and that's one of the most important ways that we're talking. Because you might be saying to other people something different, but in your heart, you're talking. So are your inner talk, uh, your inner talk, is that showing that you trust God? And do you talk to others as if you trust God? Um, and the third T, the thrust, remember, is am I behaving as if I trust God? Do I say one thing and behave in a different way that shows I really don't trust God. And so the same applies for to the delight. You can apply the T-test for yourself uh, to whether you delight yourself in God and whether you commit yourself. And the ultimate test is, are you at peace? Do you really love God? You can apply the T-test to that as well. Um, and the, the, the wonderful thing about it, wherever you are, whatever score you gave, is if you ask God, God will help you to get from where you are, whether your score is 0 or 1. Even if your score is 20, if you ask God, God will move you to the next level. Because that's what he wants for us. Because when we get to, to heaven all through eternity, our love for God will continue to grow and grow and grow as we get to know him better and better and better. And so that journey starts here on earth for us to get to know and love God more. So, my challenge to you is to apply this, um, this <coughs> message to your life, not just, this, not just today, but this week and going forward. And the challenge is to, to do the ABC, to ask, believe, and claim. So I want you to ask God to help you to trust Him, to delight yourself in Him, to commit yourself to Him, so that you can have peace. So you ask God, you believe that God is doing it, even if you don't feel it in yourself yet. And the C is you claim God's promises. So how do you claim God's promises? I want you to go to the Bible and find verses in the Bible that talks about trusting God, delighting yourself in God, enjoying God, uh, talks about commitment to God, surrender, those kinds of things. And then you pray on those verses. And you pray them back to God, because that's what God wants us to do. You say, Lord, I trust you, because, and then you can quote the scripture. Um, and then to share those scripture, God will lead you to someone, or somebody will come to you, and you'll have the opportunity to share one or more of those scriptures to others. And then the last one is to act accordingly. So it's not just about the thoughts and the talk but it's about the, the thrusting and the moving forward. 
So that's my challenge to all of us. It's not just to you, but it's to me as well. And um, just to tell you where this sermon started, many, many weeks ago I listened to a sermon um, where the, the speaker said that the seed of loving God is when we surrender ourselves to him completely. And, <clears throat> and since then, uh, I've, I've, I've not been able to get that out of my, my head. Um, and so that's where this, this message was, was born. And I keep on thinking about it. And, um, and so um, I'm inviting you to go on that, on that journey as well. So if you, do, if you don't want to, where to know where to start, start with that one then, commitment. And, and think and pray about that um, and, and see how God will, will grow you and, and draw you nearer to, to him. So that was the challenge. I'll leave you with one last thought. We started talking about fretting. So I thought we, we'll end with uh, something along those lines and just on a more positive bit of advice from an, a, a lady called Mary C. Crowley. She said, every evening, evening I turn all my worries over to God. He's going to be up all night anyway. Mm -hmm. Amen.